We were once a people who walked with our creator. When given the choice between life and the knowledge of good and evil, we chose the latter in an attempt to be more like God. This resulted in us embracing shame and guilt, and we were sent east. We embraced jealousy, murder, and exile. We decided that we could be judge and executioner. Who needs God when we can build towers? Once again, the consequence was exile. Create in me a clean heart. God called Abram, whose son was Isaac the trickster, whose son was Jacob, who would be called Israel. For I have turned His son was Judah, who wronged Tamar, who tricked Judah, who gave birth to Perez. Save us from our ways. Oh, Judah also took part in the selling of Joseph into slavery, which ended up with the people of Israel being taken into slavery themselves. For we have to. Once again, exile. Lord, have mercy. We will run to you, we will run to you. Turning from our sin, we return to you. Father, hear your world, make all things new. comes Moses. The great Moses, the Savior, come to lead God's people out of slavery and into the great exodus. The reason we gather here this week to remember when the Spirit of God passed over his children. Moses brought us freedom, the Torah, the way, 
the priestly line from Aaron to help us fulfill the law and come to our God. We traveled, we worshipped, and we were people contently walking with our Creator. Until we weren't content at all. We worried, we complained. We demanded a golden calf and judges and finally a king. We told God that it wasn't enough for us to be ruled by him and him alone, so... He gave us exactly what we asked for. See, after Saul comes King David, the great King David. David brought us the promised land. He brought us Zion. He brought us into Jerusalem. From Uriah the Hittite's wife came Solomon, who brought us the temple, the great holy place in the great holy city for the great holy people of God. We had everything that God promised us. But it wasn't enough. The temple needed more, more idols, more things to worship. We recast the golden calf. We put the Torah in a box, in a cupboard, to collect dust. We had king after king. Our nation split, more kings, more idols. Finally, God sent prophets. He sent Elijah, the great Elijah. And then more kings, then more prophets, and more idols. We returned to our own way. We forgot what it was like to walk with our creator. Then the Babylonians from the east came, and we were scattered and exiled once again. Then nothing. Nothing more from God. We just stopped hearing from our creator. We got what we asked for. We were on our own. We were ruled by empires. But we held on to what we did have. We held to the law. We rebuilt the temple. We moved back to Jerusalem forced to acknowledge other rules and rulers and gods, but at least we had Zion, at least we had the temple, and at least we had the Torah. We were ruled by the Romans with a puppet for a king. We needed a messiah. We needed a great miracle worker like Moses. We needed a great priest like Aaron. We needed a great king like David. We needed a great prophet like Elijah. Something or someone to get us out of this oppression. Then came Jesus of Nazareth. Small town rabbi from Galilee. His accent all wrong, but his following on the rise. He escaped the murder of children like Moses. He came from the line of David. He was cleansed and anointed for priestly duty like Aaron. He was Jesus the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. Coming out of Egypt, Jesus passed through the baptismal waters blessed by God. Where we failed in the desert, Jesus passed the tests. He brought us a new sound with a new message that the kingdom of heaven is here, the kingdom where God was once forever and always king. And in that kingdom, with that king, the poor in spirit are blessed. Those who mourn are comforted and the meek inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness get their fill. The merciful are shown mercy. The pure in heart walk with their creator. The salt is salty. The light is lit. The law is fulfilled. And we don't have a worry in the world. In that kingdom we come before the king and say, Hey, dad, he looks after us. He cares for us more than we do. We don't have to cast judgment. Our treasures are stored. We're answered when we ask. We find when we seek. We are greeted when we knock. And in that kingdom, lepers are healed. Servants walk again. Mother-in-laws are raised from the dead. Storms are calmed. The possessed are restored. The blind see. The mute speak. And when we are paralyzed and exiled and cast out and doomed and cursed, this man looks to us and he says, Take heart, sons and daughters, your sins are forgiven. We then take our mats and go out, having been made new. He came into Zion as a conquering king. He cleansed the temple like a great high priest. He healed the sick like a man with a staff and a people to lead out of slavery. He spoke like a prophet, but he died like one too. Jesus was arrested. He was put through a mockery of a trial before the Sanhedrin and Pilate. He was accused of and found guilty of being the son of God. 
Jesus was beaten. He was nailed to a cross with a mocking crown on his head. He was treated like a common rebel. And he, he died like one too. It didn't work. He didn't do it. He didn't take over. He didn't overthrow Rome. He didn't take the seat from the Roman appointed king of Israel. He didn't become the high priest. He didn't bring us out of oppression. Nothing. If he just died like all the others, then what was any of this about? I mean, that's not to say that things didn't get weird. When he died, the world went dark. The ground shook. The dead were raised to life, and the curtain in the temple was somehow torn. Jesus was taken down from the cross and buried, and his body was guarded. But then, uh, after the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, and now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. And so... Afraid, yet filled with joy, we run to him once again, because he is here. He is here. He's right here. In this room, in your heart. He is near, nearer than breath heartbeat, nearer than you are to you, closer than second chance or next opportunity, closer than tonight or yesterday. He is real, more real than touch, see, hear, smell, or taste, more real than reality. He is our reality, more real than joy, pain, sorrow, or the love of being in love. He is present like space, wind, time, silence, night. He is waiting like creation, like words on the tip of tongue, like songs that have yet to be sung. He is beauty and oranges, blues, every hue, every shade, sunset and sunrise, whisper his name. He is holy, cannot be touched, explained like sweet seconds of prayer, like grandmother on knees, wood floor bare. He is old hymns, the extending of limbs, stretch across trees, stripes to heal disease. He is sun, distinctly three, distinctly one, the only one, the only wise, the only resurrector of lives. He is king. And no earthly throne can house him. No amount of elegant words can espouse him. He is moment and voice, power of choice in word and deed, in fruit and seed, nailed hands, nailed feet, innocent wounds that bleed. He is believe. He is all. He is call and purpose. Everything we can sacrifice, he's worth it and more, much more. Our good deeds are mere pennies. We'll never even score. He is behold and wow. He is who, what, when, why, how. He's the one who puts on the shoes. 
we are celebrating because we know the end of the story. We know you are risen and we are thankful for that today, so grateful. We are thankful that you live here, you live with us, you live in our hearts and we are here to celebrate that this morning, our risen saviour. Thank you, Father, for your sacrifice. Thank you that you are everything, that you are all, that you are king, you are king of all kings. Thank you, Father, that you are on your throne this morning and we praise you. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. We are going to continue our praise this morning as the band comes up. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is our strength and our song. He has become our victory. You are our God and we will praise you. You are our God and we will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Ever. We're going to continue singing this morning the words, He lives, I know that my Redeemer lives. we do that though, I just want to acknowledge the fact that um, our leader, uh, one of our leaders, um, Captain Nathan is away today. It was his voice that you were hearing first thing this morning over the video. He's missing us. Um, we're missing him. Um, we are grateful that Naomi is with us today. <laughs> yeah. Um, and their family's been struck down with COVID over the last couple of weeks. So we are grateful for healing, um, for strength that um, Naomi is back with us. And we pray that over Nathan in the coming um, week, as well as many of our other congregation. We were short on Friday night, Recovery Church music team and lots of others um, have been struck down, as we know, and I'm sure we have all got people in our own families um, as this disease continues to plague us. Um, and we pray against that every week. Um, 
But yeah, it was great to hear Nathan's voice this morning um, as he recorded that through his sickness. Um, so it has been a blessing for us, and we're going to hear a little bit more from him later on in the meeting. So as you bring your tithes and offerings, let's just remember Christ is alive, and we can sing about that today. So let's remember that whenever we're digging into Scripture, uh, we're working through the book of Matthew, um, we have to ask ourselves some questions. And one of those questions is, what is the author trying to tell us? What's Matthew trying to tell us? Now, through the Easter story, um, and through basically, you know, like East, the Easter story as we know it is, the, is kind of the culmination of Matthew's gospel. Um, it's in Matthew's gospel, it's basically the last thing that happens. And, and for Matthew, he's challenging two major concepts that existed at the time. One of those is, as, as we've talked about throughout Matthew's gospel, what Messiah you're looking for. And the other is what, what um, basically what religious constructs have you, have you invested your heart into. Those are the two major things. And so when we come to this Easter story, those are the two major questions that, that we have to ask. So, um, reminding you guys that when the Messiah, when we talk about Messiah, we're talking about they're either waiting for a king, uh, a priest, a prophet, or a like miracle worker. Um, and so it, it was one of those four things, and that's what they were looking for. And then the things that were important to them, the things that they held close to their heart, were their belief systems, um, was their, their temple, and, and it was their, their form of worship. You know, so their adherence to, adherence to the law through that. Um, and and that's, that's what the author's really challenging. That's what Matthew's really challenging. So then Jesus comes, and, and throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus is challenging these things over and over and over again. And we even see it in his triumphant entry into Jerusalem where he comes and he challenges these four major concepts of what the Messiah should look like. And then he challenges the, he immediately challenges the, the religious constructs that existed that were centered in Jerusalem. And we have to really wrestle with these, and this is the time of year to do it. You know, Easter, you know, Easter for us was Passover for the Jewish people, and that was the time of year where they get together and they remember that they were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt, and they remember that their God brought them out of that. And they do these rituals to remember that. And for Easter, we've kind of replaced it. We've replaced Passover with Easter in, in the Western church, and and I think we, we love to really focus on Jesus dying for our sins and Jesus making atonement and Jesus being the Lamb of God that was slain. Um, but I think a really important thing that, that we're going we're gonna to give focus to is that, that God came as king. And Jesus being, you know, like, presented as king as he comes into Jerusalem. 
This is God reclaiming his throne. And when, when Jesus presents himself, we're confronted and we have to confront our ideas of what the Messiah should look like. Because we see what we're looking for. So if we're looking for a king, we'll see a king. If we're looking for a prophet, if we're looking for a priest, if we're looking for a miracle worker, that's the Messiah we're going to look for. And when, when the Messiah presents himself, when Jesus presents himself, we have to choose between our picture of him and the reality of him. And it's really similar with, uh, with our religious constructs. So when we're confronted with God on his throne, does it look like our accepted belief systems when Jesus teaches something is that what we believe is that the is that acceptable belief of our time uh, when Jesus presents uh, you know when, when Jesus curses the temple will we be more mad about that than than what he's presenting as hey this is a failed system when Jesus overthrows that failed system of worship the system of worship that was like you know, here's what you do for atonement. Here's what, and when, and when, we, when we make that something else and Jesus comes and confronts it, do we reject Jesus because we love that thing? If Jesus walked in and canceled our favorite mode of worship, would we rebel against Jesus or would we go with him? And that's the question I think that's really important for us to ask ourselves around this time of Easter. I'll remind you guys that we, we give a hard time to the Jewish uh, leaders who, cr who sent Jesus to be crucified by the Romans. We give them a hard time because it's easy to give them a hard time because we're not in their position. But thinking about, you know, like, Rome let you be who you were. They let you have your culture. They let you have your forms of worship. They let the Jews have the temple as long as they came under Roman rule and didn't cause any trouble. But if they can't control their own people, Ju that Rome was basically like, we will come destroy your temple if you can't control yourselves. If you can't control your people, if you got people rebelling and you got people rising up and you got, you got war in amongst your own people and you got radical rabbis teaching some crazy stuff and having these revolts, you got that going on, we will, we will destroy your temple, which is what happened. And so, you know, when Jesus, when, when they were presented with, here's the stuff Jesus is teaching and saying, and if he continues to do this, he, Rome will see this as rebellion and, and they will destroy our temple. They chose the temple over, the, over Jesus. Now, I love history. And I love especially the Bible, especially biblical history, especially church history. And as you read through the Bible, you'll, you'll realize more and more that the Bible is, is not necessarily a story of great things and great victories. It is, it's, the vast majority of the Bible is, uh, is stuff not to do. And um, now I'm, I'm a confident person and I'm usually confident in my beliefs, but I'm not arrogant enough to believe that I have figured something out that no one else ever has. And I'm not arrogant enough to believe that somehow I've fallen into an era where we've, where we've perfected the balance between belief systems and sacred spaces and forms of worship. I, I'm not arrogant enough to believe that I have somehow manifested the perfect image of the Messiah I'm not arrogant enough to believe that if Jesus walked through the door, that I wouldn't miss him. That's, it's, you know, it's not a, not a fear that keeps me up at night, but it's a thing of like, I want to constantly be checking in on myself. And the questions I have to ask myself are, what's the Messiah I'm looking for? And what are the religious constructs that I hold so close to my heart that I would fight for them? And we're reminded of one other thing around Easter time. And that is when you really dig into the things that Jesus did and the things that Jesus taught and the things that Jesus said and how he died and how he was resurrected and what all of that meant when you look into like, hey, what do these things mean? What you come to realize is that he didn't actually come to bring a new kingdom. 
He didn't actually come to bring a, a new God. He didn't come to bring a new faith. He didn't come to bring a new style or form of worship. What he came to do was remind us of how it was supposed to be from the very start. Now, we really talk a lot about like Jesus, the lamb that was slain and took the sins of the people. The very first law that God gave his people in the Torah, in the laws of Moses, in Leviticus chapters 1 through 6, the very first laws given by God was that atonement system. It was there from the start. We were always supposed to have access to that. Jesus didn't bring a new one. He, he simply brought a, like, a reinterpretation of it. But all of it was this reminder of this is how it was supposed to be from the very beginning, guys. This is how you're supposed to live. And Jesus didn't come as a new king in a new faith in a new religion. Jesus came to rethrone God. And God was supposed to be on the throne the whole time. And for us, what that means is that you know, I think we, we tend to get wrapped up in where to look for Jesus. And again, we tend to look for the things that we've held close to our hearts. We look in right belief, correct theology, correct doctrine, correct belief systems, correct interpretation of the Bible. We look for sacred spaces, temples, buildings, cathedrals, prayer rooms. What are, you know, what's the space that God exists? What's the space where I meet with God? And we, we start to battle over those things because we get emotionally invested in them. We start to battle over worship preferences and models and, and is it this and is it that and are we allowed to have this and are we allowed to have that and is this acceptable in God in God's sight and is this not? You know, like, what's the, what's the acceptable form of worship? And we, we get obsessed with those things. And we're looking for those things. And then the Messiah, we... Uh, we fight about those things, we fight for those things because we believe passionately in them. Uh, and then when we're looking for a Messiah, we're looking, well, my Messiah looks like a king, or my Messiah looks like a great miracle worker, my Messiah looks like a high priest who follows the high priestly duties by the letter, or my Messiah looks like a great prophet who speaks the truth. And we're all looking for our favorite preacher or our favorite worship leader or our favorite podcaster or our favorite author or our favorite thing. And all of those are little slight variations on the Messiah we're looking for. But what we've got to be really aware of and what Easter presents is a perfect time for us to reflect on is if God presented himself, would we be so wrapped up in the Messiah we're looking for that we miss him? And if God came and challenged the, the beliefs and spaces and models that we hold dear, would we choose those models over God? It's easy to rebuke the stories, the people in the Bible who rejected Jesus. But these were not people who were like void of God. These were, this was the church. So Easter is a perfect time for us to reflect on that. And as we, as we carry on worshiping together, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that you take part, and I'll be doing this ritual here. And the ritual for me, and it's my ritual every Easter, is I, I symbolically take my glasses off, take my filters off, the thing, you know, what the Messiah I'm looking for. I take it off, whatever it is. I think about it. And I put it down at the mercy seat. And if I was there with you, I would be walking up the front as a symbolic gesture of my covenant with God to always look for the reality that he presents himself in rather than the figure I've decided. So I take that off. I take my filters off and I pray, God, show me who you really are as you really are so that I may follow and worship you. And then what I do is I take the things that I've bound up close to my heart, my belief systems, I take my sacred spaces, and I take my forms, my preferred forms of worship, and I take them and I put them at the mercy seat and I let them go. And I say to God, God, the, the, my, 
my beliefs and my spaces and my forms of worship mean absolutely nothing if you are not what I'm seeking in those. God, please do not allow me to go another year holding on to those things over the incarnate God. So that's what we're going to do. Just go into this time. And uh, I'm a big believer in the choices we make. We, we make choices every day in all sorts of ways. And Easter is a great time for us to remind ourselves and really take stock of what are the choices I make. And if God presented himself in front of me here today, would I accept him as he presents himself? Or would I miss him because I'm looking for something different? And would I fight him because there's things that I hold dear that he's challenging? So God, come and move, move amongst your people this morning. Speak to us, challenge us, and help us to see that um, the kingdom that we might be waiting for, that we're looking for, might not be the kingdom you present. And the king that you are might not be the things that we hold dear. But God, help us to start seeing, help us to start seeing the kingdom that has always been in and around us. God, help us to help us to break the mold of just looking for proper belief or, or sacred spaces or proper forms of worship. Help us to break that mold and start looking everywhere. And God, I just pray that you open our eyes to the pictures of our families on our mantelpieces, open our eyes to the comfy chairs and coffee tables and cafes and, and spaces where we meet together, open our eyes to the dinners that we share together, the, the afternoon teas that we share together, open our eyes to the, to the small little things that we do to bless each other, to help, to help bless other people, open our eyes to the ways that we reach out and show love and compassion and mercy to, to, to your people. God, help us to look to our left and our right here and, and look at those people and just show us that this is the kingdom. That these things that have always been here, this is the kingdom. God, help us not to look to the stage. Help us not to look to the flashy things. Remind us that the kingdom that we're being introduced to and reminded of on Easter weekend is the kingdom that you established in Eden. It's how we were always meant to be. And God, help us to today be a people that contently walk with our Creator. Keep speaking to us this morning. So there's our invitation. We're going to continue in this time of worship, just spending some time to reflect on those words. And the words we're going to sing start with how great the chasm that lay between us. We may have made that chasm even bigger by the things that we've put in, in front of Jesus. Things that we might hold dear to, just as Nathan said, that may be not what Jesus wants us to be doing. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Jesus will meet us there. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. He did it on the cross. The end is written. And Jesus Christ is my living hope. He can be your living hope. He is our living hope today. Just reflect on these words. Sing along. Respond if you need to. And just use this time as a, a time to reflect and to listen to what God is saying to you this morning. Oh, God. 
Your bear. 
work at the beach this morning to really wild, grey-looking waves that were tumbling in, and there was a little, a little chink in the sky, and the sunlight was coming through. I think you've probably all experienced that. Anyone that spends any time at the beach has experienced the beauty of that. And it was like the waves were roaring, the roaring that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Amen. We're going to finish this morning our final song following these beautiful words of Jesus being our living hope. Thine is the glory, risen, conquering son, conquering. He continues to conquer. He's not conquered. He continues to conquer. Jesus Christ, conquering son, endless is the victory that you've won. And I invite you to stand this morning and lift your voices, lift them high, lift them loud, lift your arms, lift your hands in praise to our living, risen Christ. Amen? Amen. Stand with me. Nathan's final words to us this morning. And so, as we conclude our time together over this Easter weekend, let us remember the things God has done and continues to do for us. Let us refocus our eyes. Let us renew our hearts. Let us retrain our minds, bodies, and souls to love the Lord our God. Let us retrace the steps we took when we were a people who walked with our Creator. May the Holy Spirit be our great miracle worker. May Jesus Christ be our high priest and prophet. May God be our one true king. 
we conclude our gathering, but Jesus is far from done with us today. Amen. When you are faced with the choice between the Messiah you've been looking for and the true God that presents himself as he really is, may you be able to look Jesus in the face and declare him as Lord. Then hear him say to you, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, fully immersing them in the realities of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen and amen. God bless you this Easter. And I hope you've got some chocolate at home to go and eat because that's awesome. (laughs) Thanks, Ben.